This basically eliminates the need of having some mid or junior developer doing the work for you. And in many cases, this might actually be faster and more efficient than that developer. Hello everybody, I'm Nick and in this video I'm going to try the brand new GPT-4 model that was just released by OpenAI in ChatGPT. Now, I am a ChatGPT Plus member, so I can already use it. As you can see, it is an option in this dropdown. However, I haven't tried it at all. I just woke up to the announcement and I'm walking into this blind. The previous video I made on ChatGPT with the old model was impressive, but at the time of recording, I had already tried the model, knew what it could and could not do, and I had to try it many, many times until it eventually got to the right answers that made sense. Needless to say, it wasn't great. In this video, I will only give it a single chance, and I have a set of questions I want to ask it, both in software engineering and solution architecture. And it's going to be questions that both junior, mid and senior developers would need to answer as part of the day job. If you like that of content and you want to see more, make sure you subscribe, ring the notification bell and for more training, check out nickchapsters.com. All right, so let's see what we have here. So we have these three models, right? The default, which is supposed to be fair in reasoning, very fast and not really concise. Then you have the legacy model, which I don't know if it was the original GPT or not, but it seems to be a previous chat GPT plus model, which has different characteristics. And then GPT-4, which is supposed to be the most advanced where you have excellence in reasoning and conciseness, but it's not as fast. And we're going to use that. Oh, interesting. So the first thing I see here is that there's a cap of 100 messages for every four hours. So I guess they rate limited because of how much computationally intense it is. So what I'm going to ask it as the first question is, please create a REST API with C Sharp and .NET 6 that allows users to create, retrieve, update and delete movies and also rate them. Think Rotten Tomatoes or IMDb, an API for those things where you can list a movie and rate it. And then use Postgres for the database and Entity Framework for the data access. Entity Framework is like an ORM in .NET. So let's see what it can do with that. So straight away, just like before, we have the same streamed response. And I would say it's equally as slow. So let's wait and see what it spits out. So far, so good. Everything here is things I would do. So we have the settings, we would get the whole file previously. Sometimes you would get it, sometimes you would only get the line you need to add. Uh, you have the model and it is using Entity Framework, which allows you to have nested objects that point into other objects and generate a database on demand. Then it knows to make a movie DB context as well. Movies and ratings, great. Now it's going to use a startup.cs, which we don't really use anymore in C Sharp, but given when this was trained, this was very much relevant. Now, one of the things I wouldn't do in that startup.cs is run migrations there. I would actually have them in the program.cs, but that is not a huge mistake, I'd say. Or it goes straight away into using a controller, it injects the DB context, and then it uses async programming properly. Oh, that's impressive. For update movie, it also handles DB update concurrency exceptions, which many people would actually forget to cover. So that's pretty cool. And then it knows to name things like the routes appropriately as a REST API should, which is the plural of the entity you're trying to deal with or the resource you're trying to deal with. And then it correctly points to the action that is supposed to give you the location header to indicate that on movie creation, that's where you can find your movie. So that's really, really impressive. Oh, and fantastic. In the end, we also get an explanation, like a documentation of everything. I'm going to tell you what, except for the thing where I had to explicitly say continue when the thing stopped, this is a perfectly valid response that you can actually use and you wouldn't be in any way wrong. Could this be done better? Sure, but you're walking into more opinionated routes. This is one of the most generic ways you can do that and it's absolutely fine. And it's the first try. All right, let's see how we can make it go further. One of the biggest problems with this is that the connection string is a raw string with passwords and usernames as plain text in the appsettings.json file. Usually what you would do is you would actually use a secrets manager like Azure Key Vault or AWS Secrets Manager, or you would load them as environment variables scoped to that specific service. So what I want to ask it is what every developer might ask. Hey, so my mate said that having connection strings in the settings as clear text is a bad practice. Any suggestions on how to make that more secure? Let's see what it says. Your mate is correct. Oh, cheers, mate. <laughs> Interesting. So it acknowledges that it is not secure and it suggests secret managers like Azure Key Vault or other tools. Interesting that it is Azure biased and I didn't get any other suggestion like 
um, AWS ones. Oh, that's so cool. So for local development, use Secrets Manager tool. And what am I supposed to use for production? Oh, environment variables. It is not wrong. As long as there's scope to the thing that's loading them, that's absolutely fine. And it also suggests Azure Key Vault, and it gives me the code. That is nuts. I'm wondering if the Microsoft money make it be more Azure biased than AWS biased. Okay, I'm gonna go a bit off the scripted questions because I wanna see if it can do this with AWS as well. Actually, we are using AWS in my company. And I'm just gonna tell you that. In the previous, oh my God, straight away, AWS Secrets Manager. In the previous video, I had to really guide it and really put things into context for it to actually give good results. This just goes into, hey, here's the documentation, read about Secrets Manager, add the NuGet package. Oh my God. And I've noticed it goes way more in depth into the thing it is talking about. The previous method will just give you way less text and basically tell you, for the rest, just figure it out. Here we're getting everything. Actually, nuts. I, I, I have no words. Jesus, the detail it goes into, even Windows specific and then I guess Linux or Mac specific settings. Like, these are right things. If I copy this, it will take me to my credentials file for AWS. This is nuts. Okay, what if I want integration tests? Write integration tests for the API using the web application factory. Let's just see some tests. The reason why I'm so excited about this is this will save me so much time. There is so much code I, and many developers I'm sure, have to write that is like this, that to a degree is roughly the same, but not exactly the same. So based on how good this is, it's gonna save me so much time and it makes the money I pay for ChatGPT Plus we're actually worth it. And here's what I think about this. Up until now, when people were asking me, will this replace people's jobs? I would say, no, I don't think so. You still need someone who knows enough to babysit it and review things. But thinking about this, I can totally see someone making a tool that a developer, an actual developer, can go into a GitHub repo, create an issue, say, that's what the issue is, go fix it, then a chat GPT bot using the API can go in, read the issue, act, and then create a pull request. And then it's just the developer reviewing the pull request and chat GPT fixing it automatically as you go. This basically eliminates the need of having some mid or junior developer doing the work for you. And in many cases, this might actually be faster and more efficient than that developer. So I'm a bit skeptical and scared. Okay, everything it said in principle here is correct. I'm pretty sure I can ask it to say add more tests and it can do that for me. Now, would I validate here for headers like this specific header? I wouldn't. I would check for the response and see that the object is what I want it to be. So it is not awesome, but it gives you a framework to work on. Okay, fine. Now when I go a bit outside of .NET specific things and say, okay, write performance tests for this API using K6. K6 is a performance testing tool that was actually bought by Grafana. Straight away, links to the documentation. And actually, is this a valid link? It is a valid link. That is so cool. Yep, that looks like exactly how a K6 project looks like, how a file looks like. It even ramps up to virtual users slowly. I didn't give it any instructions. So this is more of a load test where you gradually go into your normal load, maintain 20 virtual users, then stay there for a minute and then go lower and then go all the way down. And it knows how to call it because it has context on those API endpoints. Oh, and like I said, yeah, it acknowledges that this is a load test scenario. You can have other tests as well, like soak tests, spike tests, so many. Okay, let's go beyond what a mid or a junior developer would do. And let's talk about some infrastructure as code where it is time to deploy the application and we need to script out our infrastructure because you wouldn't go into the Azure portal or the AWS console and do things manually. You would use something like Terraform to script out the API. So I'm going to say it's time to deploy the API in AWS. My company is using Terraform. Can you write the IAC scripts necessary to deploy the API in AWS? Let's see. That's something I've never asked in the past. I've never asked in the previous video. I go off rails now to see how far I can push it. And it looks like it just does it. It chooses RDS for Postgres, ECR for the registry for the Docker image. So it will actually build it as a Docker image 
and Elastic Container Service, which is the things I have used in the past to run such APIs. It even keeps the context allow inbound traffic for the movie API. Oh, and it's also going to use Fargate, which is an excellent option for something like this. These are all valid environment variables. That is nuts. And it gets the connection string as an environment variable for the container, which is a decent approach. Now, are there better ones? Sure, you can use Azure Secrets Manager, and then the value here would be the key of the secret in Secrets Manager, so we can actually ask it to improve on this. But I'm not going to do that because I'm sure it will do it. And even this is not a bad approach, especially if you use the right access policies. But what I'm really curious to do is I'm going to tell it, here's the thing. My manager said this needs to handle 10,000 requests per second. Is this good enough? Because I can see from this account that this will only run one service, one instance of the service in Fargate. And even though there is a load balancer, there isn't some auto scaling from what I can see here. So let's wait for this to finish and let's ask it about scaling. Okay, it is finished and I am so impressed. Let's ask it that question. 10,000 requests per second. Can you handle it? The provider from script likes to have a single instance of Fargate task, which may not be able to handle, no shit, 10,000 requests per second. To handle such load, you need a not scaling group for ECS service and configure an ALB. <laughs> Look, I'm having a bit of an existential crisis here because I cannot tell you how hard I had to try with the previous model to get it to give good results. It would do great in small things, but in the bigger picture, we would just lose it. This is actually insane. Like, truly. What I'm seeing here is it can do everything a junior developer can do, mid-developer, and to be honest with this, more than what a senior developer would also do. So as long as you have someone who's competent enough to review things, this could replace a lot of people. And it sucks to say, but it is true. And companies are opportunistic. Even if what I'm seeing here is not 100% right, conceptually it is. And I can take that and slightly modify it and be there. So I'm skeptical, I'm scared, but I'm excited to see what's going on. Web3 never had a chance. This does. Look, I'm going to stop here because I'm sure that at this point, anything I ask, it will do. I think it answered every single one of those questions at first try perfectly. Definitely way better than the previous model. So I'm just going to leave this here and ask you a question. What do you think about this? Like, really? Because ChatGPT was one thing, but this is a whole different beast. Well, that's all I have for you for this video. Thank you very much for watching. And as always, keep coding. Jesus.